Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the Railroad Hour. And here comes our summer show train. Tonight, the Association of American Railroads presents a new Lawrence and Lee operetta, Long Ago, starring Gordon McRae and his charming guest, Dorothy Warren Show. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. Yes, tonight, another delightful musical first is brought to you by the American Railroad. The same railroads that bring you most of the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the fuel you burn, and all the other things you use in your daily life. Now, here is our star, Gordon McRae. Thank you, Marvin Miller, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, Dorothy Warren Show and I are going to tell you a tale of day. That were sweet long, long ago. Long, long ago. Do you remember those wonderful golden days? And the Gibson girl was all the rage. <laughs> and Mama wore a hobble skirt. <laughs> and if you had one of those strange contraptions called an automobile, everybody would yell at you. Hey, get a horse! <laughs> And do you remember the dances? Oh, sure. The slow, graceful harvest time dances. The mechanical moon in the dance pavilion would twirl around and make a million multicolored raindrops that fell all around us as we danced. Nora Bays used to sing that. Life was good and we were young and a, a whole century lay ahead of us. began with two young fellas named Ned Delaney and Jack Fleming. One June night, they went serenading a girl's dormitory with mandolin in hand. Which is a window, Jack? Right here, I think. Now look, and sing good, will you? This one's the peachiest redhead in the whole dormitory. Okay, here we go. A one, a two. By the light of the silvery moon, I want a spoon. Honey, I'll croon love's tune. Honeymoon, keep it shining in June. Oh, stop that horrible singing and go away. You're disturbing our studying. Studying? On a Sunday night? Ah, uh, this is your last chance to date us for the season. Ned here and I are off for a whole summer in New Hampshire. Yeah, but tonight our Stanley steamer's waiting, ready to chuck you to New York. What's in New York? Coney Island. Oh, come on. The sun has scattered the clouds from the side, and the air is crystal clear. The weather is grand for the kids on the sand, or the crowd that is talking of walking the pier. On a Sunday at Coney Isle, Coney Island in June, they're going and coming. 
coming and slumming and humming their favorite summer tune. Each guy and his chick looking slick as a trick as they pose for a picture cartoon. And they'll amble mile on mile for the whole afternoon. Recalling on Monday the fun on a Sunday at Coney Island in June. There's Cohen's and Kelly's for hot dogs and beer With a mustard and custard and corn off the ear We'll ring the bell just to prove that we're strong And beer will be near just to cheer you along hey! There's the roller coaster Watch how it dips and it dips and it dives Watch how the people race over to steeple chase Planning to have the time of their on a Sunday at Coney Isle, Coney Island in June, they're going and coming and slumming and humming their favorite summer tune. Each guy and his chick looking slick as a trick as they pose for a picture cartoon, and they'll amble mile on mile for the whole afternoon, recalling on no, I'm not interested in Coney Island. I'm interested in culture. Go away. Hmm. Obviously a suffragette. Yeah. We'd better get out of here, Ned. We don't want to get trapped by a woman who wants to vote. Yeah, women. Watch out. Oh, watch out. You're walking right over the parapet. Jack. Oh, oh. What's the verdict, Dr. Billing? I'm afraid you've got a broken leg, my boy. Broken leg? Well, I can still go up to New Hampshire, can I? Oh, my dear Mr. Fleming, you'll only be confined to your sofa for five or six weeks. Five or six weeks? Well, that's the whole summer. I'll go crazy. Now, 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 please, Mr. Fleming, be sensible. Oh, why don't they shoot me, Doctor? They shoot horses when they break a leg. <laughs> to Mr. Ned Delaney at the Pines, Rye, New Hampshire. My dear sir... I am writing to ask if you would do a doctor a favor. I understand you are Jack Fleming's best friend. Will you write him and try to cheer him up? He is now the most dejected young man in America. Yours very truly, Thomas Dillon, M.D. <laughs> My dear Jack, I wish I could come down to New York and cheer you up. There is not too much to see up here in New Hampshire. Oh, across the way, there's a large colonial mansion. Well, what do you know? A young lady's just appeared, Jack. Hey, there's a hammock over there. And a hammock is very becoming when one is 18 and has flecks of gold in her eyes and a dress like a Dresden China shepherdess. beginning to sing. And oh, Jack, you should hear her. She has a voice like a major league angel. And find something 
Oh, well, you wouldn't be interested in the girl across the street. And she's probably a suffragette anyway. Now, how's your leg? Dear Ned, your letter was a godsend. But write me more about that girl in the hammock, would you? What's your name? Who is she? My leg? Oh, it's, it's better. Dear Jack, the sick Pasha shall be amused. Her name's uh, Marjorie. Marjorie Daw. And I've met her. Sure enough, up close there are flecks of gold in her eyes. And she likes everything that you like, even the same song. We sat in the moonlight and I told her all about you. And almost by magic, she began to sing that silly old favorite of yours. That's all for now about Marjorie Daw. Does that make your leg feel better? Dear Ned, your letters are curing me. This may sound strange, but I think that Marjorie Daw is somebody I've known in a previous existence. Especially the flecks of gold in her eyes. I lie awake nights with my gas light turned down to the size of a star... Thinking of the pines and, and the house across the road. Oh, I long for a sight of that hammock and of Miss Marjorie Daw. Have you ever had dreams while you were wide awake? I seem to be walking down a long, cool road. And the loveliest girl in the whole world is by my side. Hello, Jack, dear. Hello, Marjorie. Marjorie Daw. May I ask a favor? Anything, anything in the world. Meet me here every night, here where everybody's in love, and nobody ever breaks a leg. Oh, of course. Every night. But how will I get there? Well, what's the name of the place? What, what train do you take? It's very simple, Jack. Just turn your gas light down to the size of a star, then slowly close your eyes, and here you are. Return for the second act of Long Ago in just a moment. These days, the world's biggest bread basket is rolling rapidly across the countryside. Yes, thousands upon thousands of railroad boxcars are busy at the job of helping turn the vast golden grain fields of the West into bread for the tables of America, cereal for millions of breakfasts, flour enough to bake a billion cakes. Much of the winter wheat harvest, delayed by weeks of heavy rains, is still to be moved. And now the spring wheat crop of the Northwest, one of the biggest in years, 
is starting on the long journey that ends up in your town on your table. And making that journey possible from wheat field to towering grain elevator to huge flour mill and on to your local baker and grocer are the railroads that connect them all together. At a cost of over a billion dollars a year for the past six years, these railroads have put into service nearly 400,000 new, bigger and better freight cars and 13,000 new, more powerful and efficient units of locomotive power. In fact, since the outbreak of war in Korea alone, the railroads have added 80,000 new freight cars to their fleet. Recently, the Kansas-Missouri floods put thousands of boxcars out of commission and disrupted carefully laid plans of building up a backlog of cars for the harvest. But despite all that, the railroads are going ahead with the job of marshalling the boxcars needed to handle this great movement from grain field to bread box. In fact, the railroads are the only form of transportation with the capacity and the organization to provide the kind of all-season, low-cost transportation service America needs. We're ready for Act Two of Long Ago, starring Gordon McRae as Jack Fleming and Dorothy Warrenshold as the girl he's only seen in his dreams. I can't wait to get there. I just can't wait. Those train wheels keep saying her name over and over and over and over. Gold in her hair, gold in her eyes, gold in her heart, like the gold in the sky. Maybe, maybe if I close my eyes, I can see her and hear her. Hello, Jack. Dear Jack. Hello, Miss Marjorie Dawn. That's it. Smile. It won't be long now. Ned, Ned, where are you? 
Anybody home? Who is it? Oh, no. Ned, quick. Where is she? Where's the colonial house and Marjorie Dog? Look, Jack, I... The house burned down and she was killed. No, no, Jack, no, no. She ran off with another guy. I, I can't stand Jack, it. Jack, will you listen to me? Well, what's wrong? Well, well, Dr. Dillon wrote me that I should cheer you up, and that's what I tried to do. I had no idea you'd come up here. Ned. There isn't any Marjorie Dog. You, you made her up. I made her up. I thought you were my friend. Jack, please listen to me. Ned Delaney, I hope I never see you again. Driver, take me back to the station. Dear Ned, how long has it been since last I wrote you? Eighteen years? Nineteen? I know it was long ago. I guess you heard I married Gert, the suffragette. The one we serenaded that night at the girls' dorm. Oh, it's true that Gert doesn't have flecks of gold in her eyes, like the girl you made up, Marjorie Daw. But I love her. And she gets such a kick out of voting. <laughs> Maybe you wonder how I got your address after all this time. Well, let me tell you the miracle that happened on my front porch this very afternoon. My daughter bounded up the stairs with a young fellow in tow. And when I looked at him, my jaw must have dropped clear to my lap. Ned! For the love of heaven, it's Ned Delaney. What's that? Why, Ned, how did you know his name? Ned's never been here before. Edward Reginald Delaney. Is that right? Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, but there's a junior tack down to your name, isn't there? Yeah, that's right. Hey, gee, your dad's remarkable. Say, are you a mind reader or something, Mr. Fleming? Oh, no, no. It's just the amazing miracle of coincidence. I used to know your dad, son. He was my best friend once. Well, gee, I'll have to write him and tell him I met you. Oh, no, 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 please. Give me his address and, and let me write him. Well, sure, Mr. Fleming. We're taking a drive later, Dad, just after dark, okay? We're going up to Coney Island. Coney Island. How about that? Have fun, baby. And that's how I happen to be writing to you, Ned. A voice out of the past. Sort of a miracle has happened. The miracle of two children meeting. Your image is out there on the lawn swing right now, holding hands, no doubt, with my beauty. It's twilight. And way across the lawn the tops of the trees, the moon's just coming up. Good Lord. She's singing a song. A song that seems to be coming out of a dream. Well, I guess the kids nowadays are latching on, as they put it, to the oldies. Was it yesterday? Or was it 10,000 years ago then? There they are, your kid and mine, as foolish and full of moonlight as all of us were. God love them. Oh, I, I guess I didn't tell you my daughter's name. Gert never knew why I wanted to give her that particular name. But you know, Ned, and I know. It's Marjorie. Marjorie Daw Fleming. You see, she's no longer make-believe. And if your Ned looks very closely, I'm sure he'll see the flecks of gold in her eyes. By the light of the silvery moon, I want to spoon to my honey I'll
Well, thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely Dorothy Warren Schull will return in just a moment. Meanwhile, our kind thanks to Newton Arnold, Katie Lee, Marvin Miller, and our entire company. Long ago, suggested by Thomas Bailey Aldrich's story, Marjorie Daw, was written as an operetta by Messrs. Lawrence and Lee. The Railroad Hour is brought to you each week at this time by the American Railroads. Friends, here's a message from the National Safety Council. A message about railroad crossing signs. Those signs are meant to protect people from accidents. And the Safety Council says that such signs, like other traffic signs along the highways, are signs of life. So when one of these signs warns you of a grade crossing, obey the warning. And obey all the signs of life and live. Gordon, it was fun being both your dream girl and your daughter in one half hour. <laughs> well, believe me, you were enchanting in three sharps and two generations, Dorothy. <laughs> well, it was a great thrill doing the premieres of these new musicals, Gordon. Tell me, what are we premiering next week? Well, I guess I might get a meaty part next week, Dorothy. A lovely Irish legend. We're going to sing the music that comes right out of the heart of the greenest island on this planet. <laughs> it's called Danny Friel, a legend of leprechauns and love. And our own folk singer, Katie Lee, will add to the Irish flavor. And I'll be practicing up on my Gaelic. See you next Monday. And we'll be looking for you, Dorothy O'Warren Show. <laughs> All aboard. Well, sir, it looks as though we're ready to pull out. And so until next week, and our new operetta, Danny Friel, this is Gordon McRae saying goodbye and goodnight to you. <laughs> Gordon McRae can be seen in Warner Brothers on Moonlight Bay. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and our music is prepared and conducted by Carmen Dragon. This is Marvin Miller saying goodbye until next week for the American Railroad. Now stay tuned for your Monday night of music on NBC. the voice of Firestone next on NBC.